Good evening and thank you all for coming on such a busy day. We have today a very important subject and uh, this is something which is very topical and many of the members had specifically requested for this topic. Uh, this is on the Data Protection Act and we have an expert to speak to us on this subject. Uh, we have Mr. Vaidhi Swaran, who is an advocate and tax consultant. It's a pleasure to introduce him to this audience. He obtained a law degree from the Madras Law College and enrolled as an advocate in 1990. He has also obtained a graduate CW, he's a graduate CWA from the Institute of Cost and Works Accountants of India and has completed ACS from the Institute of Company Secretaries of India. His legal firm operates with physical offices at Chennai and Bengaluru and provides services virtually across the country. With 33 years of experience in advisory capacity as well as through appearance before appellate authorities, tribunals and courts in matters arising under domestic and international tax laws, excise and customs, service tax, VAT, CST, GST, FEMA, RERA, company law and IBC, we have a very a person with a very varied and rich experience who is amongst us today. He is also a writer. He wrote the first comprehensive book, VAT in India, when VAT was introduced in 2005, and has also authored books on SENVAT credit, books for students appearing in the CA final examinations. Incidentally, sir, my PhD thesis was also on sales taxation. He has written hundreds of articles covering variety of issues in tax, corporate law, constitutional law and general laws in both print and digital media. And he has recently authored the book Taxation of Digital Economy, published by Oak Bridge covering international tax and indirect tax aspects of the digital world. He is considered a specialist in tax and legal matters with in-depth knowledge of the business and tax laws. He has addressed hundreds of seminars and conferences on law and taxation across the country. He has been recently appointed as a member of the advisory council formed by the government of Tamil Nadu in respect of GST and other matters. He advises various associations and chambers of commerce. He is the chairman of the expert committee on GST, Madras Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and also a member of the general committee of Madras Chamber. He is a member of the Finance and Taxation Committee of the CII. He is also a member of the SIC Indo-American Chamber of Commerce. He is the recipient of the Vocational Excellence Award from Rotary and is actively involved in various social causes through music and also forays into humor writing titled Why These Musics. Welcome, sir. So, we will not stand between you and the topic of the day, Digital Personal Data Protection Act. 2023. Thank you. Yeah. Good evening. There was a thought uh, expressed that, uh, you know, can you look at deferring the meeting considering the uh, audience numbers? I said it's not fair to the people who have come. So they've taken off their busy schedule and given the due importance to the topic. Uh, it's a sad state of affairs in our country that uh, when key developments take place, the polity does not participate. And then when it hits them later, they grumble and say, no, we don't have enough time, we have not, we've not told us before, you know, those things happen. So first of all, you know, your awareness levels are very high and thank you for that. And uh, thanks for the nice intro. Let me go straight to the presentation. I loved this quote and so I thought, you know, this is what is going to happen as we move along. This is, a, this is now almost popular adage that we hear that data is a new oil and uh, data inevitably leaves a trail and uh, we contribute to the welfare of most of these bigger companies or the bigger players in the social media and the, uh, the tech world where we voluntarily give data. So we have no qualms in giving all our data. We have absolutely no problem in sharing whatever we have. And uh, we are surprised by the fact that Facebook knows more about us. You know, we, the, the surprising part is most amusing because we tell Facebook. 
So, we tell every other uh, tech giant as to where we are, what we are doing, what we are buying, what we are not buying, who is our relative, who is not our relative, what is our relationship. Every aspect of our life is, is virtual and there are people who on an hourly basis report their schedule as to what, what they are doing and things like that. So, then obviously this data is processed, this is used and marketed and effectively you get your uh, privacy also invaded. So, there is constant debate on privacy versus freedom. One thought of one school of thought is that you know I have my right of privacy. I cannot uh, have anybody using my data. The other thought is that everything is free. What is not what is wrong in not using it? We never had a specific law for data protection. UK started this with UK GDPR. It's a very famous legislative which changed completely the way you do business in UK. In fact, even with the way you deal with business in UK changed after the GDPR law. So that is why this law will have a massive impact in India whether for your business or you are in industry or you are in society or you are in a social cause or you are just an association or a charitable organization or you are running a center or a school, college, whatever. Whatever you do, you will have an impact of this legislation which we will see as we go forward. I will skip some of these slides except I will just talk a bit about Puttasamy's case which is the famous uh, decision of the Supreme Court of the Right of Privacy where the Aadhaar Act was challenged. And when the Aadhaar Act was challenged and when it was upheld, the court recognized the concept of privacy being integral aspect of personal liberty and essential, but they also said it is not absolute right and can there can be reasonable restrictions. So, what we have done is we have enacted a new legislation called as DPDPR, D Digital Personal Data Protection Act and both houses of the parliament has passed the legislation, assent of the president has been obtained. The only one waiting part is the notified date and that can happen anytime. The notified date would be followed by some kind of rules and things like that where you will have to implement various parts of it. So, what does it apply to? It applies to processing of digital personal data that is data in digital form as well as data in physical form which is digitized subsequently. So, typically if you have data in a physical format which you subsequently scan it and upload it or you you know automate it in some form and convert that into digital data then the act applies to you also. You cannot say I only collected physical papers etc. So, physical can easily become digital and something which is collected physically and later on can modified as digitally can always change. So, typically you have professionals who scan data all of them will get into applicable. It applies to processing of digital personal data outside the territory of India if that processing is in connection with any activity relating to offering a goods or service to data principles in India. So, that means if e-commerce companies located outside India, they deal with consumers in India or they supply digital content to somebody in India or you are providing online gaming from outside India to India or airlines outside India, tourism outside India, hotels outside India, all of them collect your data. They collect your uh, ID basically, they collect your email, they collect your identification data, they collect your passport copies, they collect your information about you because they need to process all that for your own benefit, for your own reservations but all that is collection of personal data and they fall under the act. So, the scope of the act is very, very wide, not necessarily confined to Indian companies, it goes beyond Indian companies. So, non-applicability is a critical part. When can you say that the act is not applicable? For example, if I am going to hire a cook and uh, I want to be sure about some elements of uh, you know safety and security and therefore, I collect the uh, ID card of the cook for domestic purposes or I hire a driver for my own personal use and I collect his you know driving license, then that is something which is for personal or domestic purpose that is out of the act. But if the same thing is done by the company when they hire a caterer and collect the data or when they collect uh, multiple driver data by, you know for the purpose of uh, employing in the company, act will apply to them. So, personal or domestic is what is excluded. The other one is where you voluntarily go and put this data publicly. For example, there could be these influences. Today, if you have to, to look at social media, there is number of YouTube influences. There are people who recommend that this is the best product for you to get cholesterol at highest levels. This, this is the best food that you can eat for you to die in the next few years. Or there, you know, there are gluttons you see, you know, the way the kind of food consumption that they do online can scare you. But there are also good players who talk about health, who talk about uh, physical fitness, who talk about, you know, en entertainment, who talk about so many other things. These influencers post their own personal data. So, there could be somebody who is very active and they pro promote a blog on their cosmetics or, uh, or, or, or physical wellness etc. All that if you yourself are voluntarily putting it in social media act will not apply, you cannot claim protection. 
so people who are bloggers who actually have active presence in the social media and they provide the data they cannot say i need protection from this uh, the, i need protection through the, through the legislation similarly if you have a social media account like instagram this is very complicated because instagram you can have a public account as well as a private account so you can have a public post as a personal post if you do a public post then the act doesn't apply you cannot give you protection but if you put it as market as private then the act comes into play so it's you can actually switch in instagram on a, on a daily basis on an hourly basis so it is going to be quite a challenge for some of these companies to implement this legislation so then the key question is what is this personal data the definition is very clear any data about an individual who is identifiable by or in relation to such data very wide which means your identification numbers kyc passwords financial data health data sex data sex orientation data biometric genetic data caste details all of them could be identifiers uk law goes a little more further they try to identify what types of identifier but indian law is very simple it says we will try to look at any data which can identify a particular person now this can be as obnoxious as a company collecting your mobile number and email number for security reasons as you enter that building there will be a notebook outside of the watchman collecting that data that is you are going to identify a person you have collected his mobile number you have collected his name you have collected his email id and you have collected any other information his address etc you have collected personal data that because that person can be identified that's the purpose of that security the purpose of the security is to identify and some companies go even one step further they ask you further proof of your id and scan that data into the system including they take a photograph of you and then print you a visitors pass for you to go inside the organization all that means that you have collected a data which you can identify a person then the entire law comes to you what all should you do with it what all you cannot do with it comes into play so ip address cookie identifier data collected through iot data through rfid some of these cars have data which through rfid itself you can actually track where you're going data through sensors as you walk in data can be picked up your face can be recognized and you know for labor purposes employee purposes data can be collected all this will result in the application of the act so why should you be worried about you should be worried about because one we must be aware that we are collecting data then we must be also aware that the act applies to us then you must be aware that you are you are bound to do certain things and bound not to do certain things under the act failing which there are nasty consequences and that is what most of these companies have faced in international uh, jurisprudence british airways data was hacked company was fined euro 204 million marriott hackers disclosed sensitive personal information such as credit card numbers passport data huge fines again google's us users could not access the consumer data processing statement language was very vague and ambiguous the inf the information officer found the company to be guilty and huge fines again so these are all classic international jurisprudence that has already happened in terms of what is the impact of data is hacked or data is let out so the name given data principle is to ourselves whoever gives their data is the data principle if i am going to give my personal information i am a data principle now whoever is going to receive it and process it for whatever purpose is called as a data fiduciary and he may give it to an outsourced processor he may engage a chartered accountant he may engage a third party for verifying the diligence or something like that they are all data processes so interestingly for the first time in our indian history this legislation uses the word she instead of he normally in all legislation the word uses he or him and even the general clause act if you look at it talks about you know where wherever masculine gender word has been used it shall include female so that is the from the british we have, we have borrowed that and continued for the first time a legislation actually says she and her and they define she to include any individual irrespective of gender so data fiduciaries can be as i said people who have the data collection for some purpose who could that be it could be businesses industry chartered accountants company secretaries lawyers they may collect personal data all businesses collected data either for business purpose or some other statutory verification for example if you are supplying to some other uh, party that party will say for you to be recognized as a supplier i need eight items to be clarified from you i need your uh, gst number i need your name i need your id i need your cfo's data i need your personal id then only a vendor code will be generated so obviously you sh share this data to a company so companies would collect from suppliers vendors contractors service providers so everybody gives data you give your pan for tds purposes 
you know, for, for tax selection purpose, you give your PAN and that means you have shared your PAN details which can be easily identified. So, collecting passport details. So, everybody, banks, insurance, telecom, hotels, restaurants, e-com, app stores, websites, retail outlets, associations, chambers of commerce, colleges and schools, healthcare, everybody would collect personal data would get into this aspect because they are all data fiduciaries. Now, you can process the data only for a lawful purpose. That means you, nobody stops you from collecting data, but once you collect data, you can process for lawful purposes and you must ensure that she has given her consent. Which means going forward, you cannot simply collect information. There will be a consent form. You have to tell them, look, I am collecting this information for security purposes. I am collecting this information for the purpose of verifying your data before I ent allow you to enter my organization. I am collecting this data to ensure I do a check before I employ you in my company. So, all this information you have to tell him up, up hand and, and up front, get his consent in writing and then collect the data and then use it only for that purpose. So, the catch is like that. You have to tell them collect and use only for that purpose. So, it's a, it's a completely Co no, some kind of a circle they have created where in terms of what you can do and what you cannot do. And this consent must be free, specific, informed, unconditional and unambiguous, which means you, you can't have a eight page complex lengthy document prepared with lawyers uh, largest in terms of English language and expect them to you know simply sign, I agree. That is not possible. You, can, you must give simple and plain language, which is tough, which is going to be the biggest challenge for lawyers like us to, you know, uh, I, I still, you know, uh, I actually enjoyed my pressy writing classes in school days. You know, we had this, you know, in school those days, in at least our generation had a, a, a subject on pressy writing where they'll give you two pages and ask you to write in one paragraph. You now, that's a skill which is lacking today. Today, today, if you ask anybody to write something in few lines, they can't write. They write in you know, multiple pages and you ask them to convert into so they say we cannot. We have to give this much of information. So, probably going forward, you know, applications, consent forms will all to be, have to be so simple so that people understand and respond. So, the uh, consent must be very clear and unconditional. That is one of the conditions. Now, you also have new insurance mechanisms, new banking mechanisms where they verify you online. So, you take an insurance policy, the insurance policy paperwork is done and then your verification is done through a video call. So, there is a WhatsApp kind of a video call that they do where you actually read out saying that I so and so so and so agree that I've taken this policy and all those data etc. So, all that is also falling on the scope of consent. So, if somebody applies for a policy and to complete the KYC, she opts for processing of personal data through a video call, that is a process. So, prior to the collection of personal data, the company has to request for the data and also specify the purpose of processing the personal data. And you cannot use it for other purposes which we will see what happens if you later. So, typically this can be one more test for your uh, you know understanding of what kind of world we live in. If you go back home and take your phone out and look at your apps and uh, look at the permissions you have given for all the apps. Inevitably, we will say yes to everything which the app asks for, then only you can enter that app. But what the app does, it collects absolutely irrelevant information. For example, a food app would have collected access to your photo gallery. Why does Swiggy need access to your photo gallery? A radio taxi app can collect data about your location. It needs GPS location because it has to come and stop at your house. But it has no business to ask for your contact list. It would be asking and we would have given yes because we do not have checked it. Music app will ask for location data. Social media will ask access to your calendar. Calculator app will ask access to your contacts and photos. It does not need to. And games are the worst. It takes everything that you have. Basically, app world collects data because some aspects pertain to functionality, some aspects pertain to how you use it and some aspects are pertain to security and privacy. But beyond that, they should not be collecting data. And some people could be very smart by saying that, look, I will have an overall agreement which will protect me from any kind of complaints. I hereby agree that I shall not complain to the data protection board against any action done by you. No, you cannot have such an agreement. The act itself says so. You cannot have such a clause and prevent some action or a complaint. One dangerous part of this act is, the act says it will come into force from a particular date and wherever consent has been given before the commencement of the act, the act will apply to those consents also. Which means in effect, this is the most dangerous piece of the legislation because it effectively brings about retrospective effect. 
So, that is going to have a huge impact on account of language of section 6 to consent given before the date of the commencement of the act. Because that consent nobody knew, because everybody took consent. You can't apply law retrospect, you can't change the goalposts, you know, with the two years back down the lane. You can't say that you crossed the road uh, three years ago when the law did not allow you to cross the road, therefore I am penalizing you. So, that kind of consequence cannot be had. So, we hope that wiser counsel would prevail and there will be some kind of modifications to this. One other aspect of that consent is that they have added one more twist. It is going to be quite costly for a lot of companies when they seek the consent. It, if the person requests for another language, you must provide it. So, not necessarily English. If that fellow is going to create trouble for you, we can say I want it in uh, uh, Telugu or Marathi or Tamil or Urdu, one of the eight languages in uh, one of the language list in the eight schedule, you can ask. So, you, you must have technology enabling for that. It is all going to increase your cost big times. This is the best part of the legislation. Whoever has given the consent has a right to withdraw our consent. This is a new right that is called as right to be forgotten. In fact, there is a there is a writ pending in Delhi High Court where one of the one doctor has filed a writ petition saying that he was uh, there was a case that was built against him and the media went against him full heavy tongs and ultimately he was proved innocent. And therefore, he said there is so much of data still stuck in the social media, I want all that to be erased. So, right to be forgotten. In fact, in, in UK, there is a new concept called as right to repair. So, when you have, when you buy a electronic gadget today, the biggest challenge is that within one year, if something goes wrong, you go for a repair. They say this part is no longer available, this technology is no longer available, buy the next version 2. Now, uh, a right has been built up through law saying that I have a right to repair my product, therefore you, you should have for a certain period of time a part replacement policy. So, right to withdraw consent at any, any time, the ease of withdrawing must be as simple as ease of giving the consent. It cannot be the abhimanyu route where you can enter it but you cannot come out. No, that cannot happen. You must be able to easily take it out. Now, you can process for various purposes as they said, but then there could be serious issues as to what you do if you do not go beyond that. For example, X purchases medicines at a pharmacy and voluntarily provides their personal data and requests the pharmacy to acknowledge the receipt of the payment through a message to her phone. Now, this is okay because you yourself are saying that I will give you a number and then you process it. Today, you go to a cinema theatre and buy a ticket. They do not give you a receipt. They say that give me your mobile number, I will send you uh, a receipt through phone. So, the cinema theatre is collecting your mobile number. Now, if they are going to collect this mobile number, in future probably they have to first fill out a form and say, please sign this form and then give you a number. They may probably start getting back to printouts. You know, that may be easier to operate rather than doing this. Now, the data fiduciary can process personal data for the state. Now, the state has so many policies, state in the sense government. They have subsidies, they have schemes, they have benefits. They have methodologies, you know, various formats where they could have direct transfer benefits and all that. So, there could be a lot of data collection which may be required for the state and therefore, that is done and that can be used for other purpose of the state also. Certain standards will be laid down. Data fiduciary may process personal data for the performance by the state or any of instrumentalities of any function under any law for the time being in force or the interest of sovereignty or integrity of India. Now, I can fully understand and appreciate sovereignty integrity, security, all these things you definitely have to process the data and do whatever you want to do. But what is the purpose of, you know, processing personal data for any function under any law for the time being in force? It could be very, very wide and the potential for misuse is huge. So, what are the challenges? One, people may not be aware and because of lack of awareness, they will be providing significant personal data without knowledge. Forget the app. Apart from the app, there are a lot of people who voluntarily give this data when they go anywhere. You know, even before they ask, I will give you my mobile number, I will give you my this number, you know, they voluntarily give this data. In fact, you will find, you will slowly, slowly find a trend that after this legislation kicks off, after the notified date, people will st st start saying, in a data, I do not want your data. You know, they will probably insist on only basic things for them to operate. They do not want too much of information because the customer interface can have different consequences. So, a data fiduciary who collects his data has to comply with the law. He has to comply with conditions for collection. He must give informed consent, obtain informed consent. 
he cannot simply share with other group companies etc there are disclosure norms there are usage obligations whatever data processing he does with the third party he must do it under a contract and he must secure the data which he has in his possession data has to be erased if the data principal withdraws consent or as soon as it is reasonable to assume that the specified purpose is no longer being served now this is the key if information is collected for a particular purpose and that particular purpose is over why are you still storing the data he can ask you she can ask you to erase the data but you yourself can erase somebody's data if the purpose is over so this is a very very key important aspect where somebody can protect themselves by ensuring that job is over your security purpose is done you have gone out of the company i don't need this data but whether that decision can be taken in a corporate environment where they are worried about espionage or some kind of vandalism where they want this data to be stored for later police verification see they collect this data of the individual etc only for the purpose of security if you erase it as soon as it goes out the security purpose collapses you still need that information so it will be a catch 22 situation as to when you would decide to erase that particular data where a data principal makes a request in a prescribed manner for erasure of personal data the data of which is shall erase her personal data unless retention is necessary for a specified purpose for example you operate a bank account and you close the bank account now bank is obligated under law to maintain records of clients for 10 years so they can always quote the law and say look under this law i have to keep this record for 10 years therefore i am keeping it so those kind of exceptions are possible then there is somebody who will be identified as a significant data fiduciary most of the tech giants will be notified as significant data fiduciary they'll have additional responsibilities and additional obligations which may not be relevant for this audience there are exemptions obviously exemptions are the critical part of the legislation when the court processes data the court is not liable court is not responsible processing in the interest of prevention detection investigation or prosecution of offense or contravention of any law absolutely wide so anybody will any police or any agency is likely to say or any investigation agency is likely to say that i am fully entitled to do whatever i want with the data because it is for the purpose of preventing a crime or preventing an offense very wide at least if it is in the context of investigation of an offense i can understand or prosecution of a person i can understand but prevention is quite wide because you can always on suspicion basis do whatever you want to do so that is what state does they ensure that they get the all the exemptions can skip that for the moment so coming to the last few slides as i said act could be notified any time today we are in october 9 20th i am expecting the act to be by maximum it notified date could be december 1st or even somewhere mid of november eight rules are getting drafted it will be in shape and quickly rolled out and then if that happens the act would be specified that for bigger companies it will happen in 6 months you have to be ready for smaller companies maybe 9 months smaller businesses etc they'll give you some kind of time because you have to change your systems the biggest challenge would be to change your systems change the way you do business change the way you talk to people change the way you interact with people all that will have to change time would be given for complying with the new law gdpr uk gave 2 years time but our minister has very clearly said that is all too much we are all in a digital era where you have already things in place you can do much faster 2 years and all don't expect will give much shorter time there will be a data protection board unfortunately it is going to be another set of uh, uh, persons from the you know they they have categories of uh, specific specialists who they are going to talk about but inevitably we know how it works it is mostly from the the uh, uh, government community which people will be appointed biggest challenge is this language everybody collects data no doubt about it any unauthorized processing of personal data or even accidental disclosure acquisition sharing use or loss of access would attract certain consequences which means accidental disclosure by mistake data goes out by error or something happens data goes out what are the consequences for example ms shine is an employee at ym is it a top modeling agency she takes care of all the contract or signing of the models she receives an email on her work desktop that she has won tickets to an exclusive gala event and a link is provided with enthusiasm she clicks the link over hacker has come into the system and this is typically happening across the country so hacker enters the system and takes all the personal data of all the various models or the company is liable for breach of the act 
and if that kind of thing happens what are the consequences huge penalties will be determined by the board of course board will take into account nature gravity type of offense nature of breach all those things but the penalty numbers are mind boggling if there is a breach in data fiduciary obligations your penalty is up to 250 crores so this is the saddest or powerful part of this legislation it no may, people may not even have that kind of turnover that 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 kind of penalties that are contemplated that is the seriousness of this legislation in terms of what is contemplated so opening of pandarax box in complaints it will also open up everybody to start complaining to data board saying because when they have a chance to impose a penalty of this magnitude other unethical practices will also follow so complaints will also start and of course board will start its enquiry closure all those aspects and it will become a full fledged legal law segment by itself timeline for compliance as i said different timelines are likely market practice of collecting large volumes of data by taking bundle consent will have to change all your contracts policies have to be revisited your data sharing policies should be revisited your data security has to be strengthened your consent managers will have to be appointed by companies to ensure that they operate in the right side of law so the one which i talked about retrospective impact we have to track that and see if there is some change or at least we be aware of what happens contracts definitely have to be redrafted all of the existing contracts will not settle the will not, will not meet the requirements of law new contracts have to be drafted carefully taking into account how, how the act is going to come all your communications will have to change basically what could what should happen is you should review your business and see who has consumer interface because what happens is a big organization will have multiple intermediaries multiple contractors subcontractors sub vendors etc whom they allow them to do in various forms of business and they would engage further subcontractors etc and they would interact with the consumer and collect data for the company so you may think that i am not collecting data at all but somebody is collecting data on your behalf and that would affect you at a later point of time so you need to do an analysis to find out who is collecting consumer related information for our company and how does it work so the interface the entire supply chain has to be sensitized into understanding what is collected and how is it collected so every organization institution has to examine the applicability or non applicability and review your documentation all your personal data of employees which you are collecting may have to be reviewed and look at how you collect consent how you collect Uh, how you store information how you withdraw consent etc main thing your cyber security spending has to go up there's no other choice you cannot you know yana konnu agadu kind of thing idella yarko somebody else has an impact no you may have to strengthen your cyber security system at least ensure it is reviewed <laughs> in fact i remember a, a joke um it's a sad state of affairs uh, you know a massive security assessment was done for a big institution and they found uh, loopholes of cyber security and they basically they found that look your password system is very bad and uh, your passwords are not adequate at all you keep changing the passwords on a, on, a, on a weekly basis even if you want to on a daily basis so the company went overboard and changed on a daily basis so and then a uh, few months later the professional came back to verify and said that yes sir uh, we follow your system completely we have changed passwords on a daily basis and that's a huge thing your guys are very smart to operate on a daily basis how do you manage no no every day morning our office boy gives the that day's password to everybody's desk <laughs> or cyber security and security so cyber security system you have to definitely enhance to prevent accidental disclosure of course there is nothing as perfect security something can always go wrong but at least you can when you when the when somebody calls you for penalties you can say look this is what i've invested this is what i've taken as efforts and despite that something has happened could be at least some kind of reduction of penalty and today an individual consent is a very powerful tool so as consumers as individuals we also have a right as to what we give what we not give ask questions as to why are you asking this information what purpose are you asking this information i can't simply provide this information of course the standard answer for a vendor is unless you provide this data i cannot provide the service to you that's a typical response which he gives but going forward they may not be able to do that so going forward they it is not easy because they'll be they'll be advised by their uh, higher up saying that don't do all these things your customer interaction itself can be very very different and how it works is also changed so this legislation is in my view a path breaking change in indian law and how indian businesses indian institutions operate how they deal with individual uh, personal data and it is also a big eye opener from an individual right perspective as to he for the first time he she gets the right to protect her own personal data
of course if she is going to voluntarily put something on on the space there and say do whatever you want that is her call but if she wants to hold back and say no you cannot use my data beyond this point she has every right and consequences follow if somebody is going to breach that so that completes my uh, uh, address as far as uh, this policy is concerned as i said concern way forward is going to be the key how you take the concern how you manage the concern will have to be very taking uh, very carefully done awareness is the key and uh, the more uh, the earlier businesses and industry and institutions get awareness about this legislation the better they can take care of their you know possible violations and rectify things as they move forward because what could happen is non awareness or lack of awareness or not being aware of this legislation would mean that they will blissfully sign contracts blissfully sign agreements blissfully collect data for the past and this can have a past effect also retrospective effect so going forward at least if you are little more cautious on what data you collect then that kind kind of protects you in some way and you will have also impact on ai because ai simply collects all kinds of data and processes it so if you are running that ai tool to collect all kinds of information when somebody comes in your website so typically what happens if somebody walks in your website there are enough mechanisms to ensure that you capture all kinds of data about him so you are actually connecting so much of information about somebody without telling them now you have to tell them and also tell them why and that is the key part of it what are you collecting and why are you collecting those two key information when you provide the customer may not give the data because he will he will immediately know why this particular thing is asked for so it has to be very carefully done going forward so i think this is a, a legislation which is going to change what we do what we live etc because this changed in europe in the gdpr completely altered uk and parts of europe as to how they change and I, i'm no i'm quite sure india will also go through a massive change as far as this law is concerned and government is very keen in pushing this legislation as a key piece because this was a missing piece of legislation in our growth world over people are saying you don't have a data protection law you don't have a data protection law in india while you have you talk about rule of law you talk about democracy and all that so this was a missing piece in the jigsaw puzzle and they finally decided to plug that and ensure we have a good law with that i thank you all for coming today and thank you for a very patient hearing and thank to cic for calling me here So we are open for questions. Anyone has a question? How much is the government liable to this law? Is what is called as a Justice Sri Krishna Committee report. Yeah. So Justice Sri Krishna Committee was formed, and he recommended what this law should be, and he did not talk about this kind of exemptions which is contemplated in this law. So what government has done, lawmakers have done, is as usual they have protected themselves completely. so they have insulated themselves from the operation of this act in any way they can do so i talked about the exemptions i talked about section 17 so government is well protected and insulated they can collect anybody's data they can collect for one subsidy scheme and use the data for another benefit scheme or they may use it for something else you know for example they may collect this information to say that i have this this data is collected for the purpose of checking whether you are eligible for 1000 rupees or not but in that process so much of information will be collected about you and that information could be used for something else also but they get the immunity so no but can they can they uh, also share it with private organizations no they cannot share it with private for instance aadhar mm. is run by a private organization it's not run by a government organization but that's what when puttasamy's case that was the biggest challenge as to you know the uh, aadhar is uh, violating privacy and it is run by a private organization right and in supreme court uh, that organization i forgot his name he made a presentation before the court and actually did a ppt before the court and established and uh, how it is secure and all that but if you look at the old aadhar act as it stood the data could be stored for about 7 years or something but uh, supreme court struck it down and today any data collected for the purpose of issuing aadhar has to be destroyed within 6 months so supreme court gave some guidelines but they upheld all the provisions of aadhar act including udai so udai controlling that aadhar etc is done yeah. so some element of aadhar can be seen but the main main element of aadhar cannot be seen even if it is used for identification purposes but that kind of uh, you know sharing of uh, data which you collect for you know other subsidy schemes or benefit schemes etc you cannot give it to the private sector governments can share amongst governments governments can use it for cross schemes or government can use it for their own purposes but they can't sell it to the private sector or share it to the private sector i find it very informative the presentation that you gave i would like to thank you but um 
I remember uh, many instances where they simply take up a smartphone and uh, photograph us or videograph us without taking our permission. And you find in houses, uh, these cameras, uh, it will be facing the road so that they catch the, uh, videograph the public also. Is that right uh, in this const, uh, because this is an extension of uh, data protection also and uh, right to privacy is also breached. So would you enlighten us on? Excellent question. In fact, uh, today the level of surveillance is probably the highest in the world. Forget India. Every other country, the level of surveillance is, uh, Singapore is probably a classic example of, you know, uh, where privacy does not even exist. So everywhere in the world, you are watched, you are seen, you are read, etc. But then the Indian approach to that is, so what? You, if you want to read my messages, please go ahead and read. If, if, if you want to, you know, lose your sanity in the process, well, jo please join the club. So that seems to be the thought process. But let us say a, a apartment association has put up a security complex, I mean security system, where there are cameras inside and outside. And as you enter the apartment complex, you are photographed, you are videographed, your identification is done. And probably you may also have to give your ID before you are able to go process into it. Now, will it fall under for domestic usage is one of the exemptions. Anything data that is processed for domestic usage, this act will not apply. That is a possible interpretation to say act will not apply. But if it goes beyond that, for example, while you're walking in the road and some collection of data happens through a camera or something like that. Now, they may say that this is for the purpose of prevention of a crime. So that is also an exemption. exemption. So there's an exemption to say that to prevention investigation, that, that umbrella is quite, quite, quite. But so long as it is a state agency which is doing it, you may probably get that exemption. But if you're not a state instrumentality and you're a private player who wants to collect this kind of information while you're walking on the road, then you'll be pulled up. Um, with, uh, with regard to this point, actually, uh, you know, we, uh, one of our alumni in our school, Vidya Sagar, um, he passed away, he met with an accident and we, we could capture it only with the help of a, uh, CCTV footage in the opposite road, uh, you know, in the same road in the opposite uh, building. So, uh, it is also helpful in some extent. Yeah, it has right? to be a tough balance because, you know, uh, we need these cameras for our security also. We need this kind of uh, surveillance for our own protection also. It's a tough balance as to how much of inroads happens. But the, the today, many of the crimes are investigated by the police through the help of these domestic uh, association cameras. In many cases, at least, they're able to you know lo look at the local street camera, then track the person's movement, find out who has done it, etc. But some pro in, in many flats, the biggest problem is they installed the camera, but they never activated it after a point of time it became, you know, it will just give the impression that there is a camera, it won't work at all. So, but that serves the purpose. You know, the, the person who is an intruder thinks that there is a camera. So that's, that kind of serves the purpose. But is that data? Photos is that data. covered under digital data? Photos data. Photos data. Images is also data. And what comes under digital data and what doesn't come under digital data? And a second question is like, uh, uh, we NGOs, uh, you know, or uh, uh, community workers, just just like that, get data of um, you know people who we uh, work with, and uh, um, we also share. Uh, some people also come and ask us like, we want to serve this particular group, and you give us some information, and even the government uh, workers, uh, you know, community workers, and we just give give it. Uh, as word of mouth. So, all these, will these come under uh, this act? You need to change the way you collect data and you may also have to inform what you do, what you don't do with the data in terms of sharing extra at the time of consent. Uh, there will be forms that are notified, formats that are notified for this purpose, but I know what kind of organization you do. So, once the legislation comes, once the rules comes, con get in touch with me, I will do it free for you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you collect data for, for donors, you then uh, you look at uh, uh, co-group workers, you look at organizations which you partner with for a particular project uh, or CSR, for example, you're linking with somebody. So you will collect data. All the law now says is you know why you're collecting. Please tell them why you're collecting and process the data only for that purpose. So you must sit and visualize what all we're doing with this. List it out. 
I will share it with my co-partner, I will share it with my co-organization, I will share it with my alumni, I will share it with other uh, bodies who are interested in similar kind of things. So tell them that I will disclose all this, I will share this with so-and-so body and get their consent, informed consent that I agree that you can share this data. So once that agreement is obtained, then you are on the bona fide part of collecting the data. Then the second part is the safeguard of the data. That's a tricky part. First part is you should be careful in ensuring that you disclose upfront as to what all you're going to use the data for. So which means that you may have to sit back and visit the past and see what all you've done with this kind of information and then document it and get their consent. That's what is required. I, while I understood the part of uh, collecting individual uh, data, so we need to get the consent and all that. Uh, I am not very clear on uh, what the business is, suppose business to business, uh, as a customers and suppliers, we, we onboard. Is there any uh, See, on, when you are onboarding a supplier, when you are identifying a vendor who can supply goods or services to you, Today, because of GST or income tax, you want enough information about them. Plus, you also have a vendor policy, vendor coding. If you're a multinational, you'll have even more stricter norms. So what happens is that you collect the data about that entity, first of all. You collect their you know, business ID, you will collect their address, you collect their uh, background, all that you collect. That is fine. That is not personal data because there is not identifying something. But you go one step further and then you ask as to who is the person to contact, who is the marketing head, who is the procurement head, what is his mobile number? What is his email number? What is his photograph? What is his identification? When you touch that border, when you cross that border, you're getting into personal data. Might be, uh, the sales, team, uh, no, sales team has to be sensitized. sensitized. Okay. That's what I said. Okay. Say you may have to sensitize yeah. the teams which deal with all these people. Right. Okay. Thank you. Ma'am, you had a question. Yeah, we, you know, we are now, these are days of public-private partnerships. Small, small to big ways, modest apprentice varies, but the various ways of doing it. For example, if you look at uh, the massive rural development programs, you know, it's not state which is actually doing it. In many places it's outsourced to agencies and therefore tho those are actually the custodians of those, uh, the whatever data is actually with an outsourced agency, not really with the government. And when you are saying there is immunity for government uh, itself that they've provided, safeguards for themselves, then uh, it's not difficult to fix government if you're going to be outsourced. How, wh how, where, how does this play out? See, that is also contemplated in the law. What happens is the, there could be data fiduciaries who process the data for state instrumentalities. So state instrumentalities is your central government, state government, local body, whatever it is. Correct. They engage a third party for the purpose of processing data for their policy, for their initiatives, etc. So when that processor is doing this work for the state instrumentality, he is also given the necessary protections. It will be identified as a permitted purpose. It will not be identified as an illegal purpose. So already consent is taken at the state level in terms of your information. You, you know, you are, you are part of the scheme. Whatever data will be used for other schemes, one line will be there. That processing of the data, KYC verification of that person, verifying the background check of that person will all be given to an outsourced party, third party or a PP, uh, public power private party or some other charitable organization or an NGO which does that or an IIT which does that. All of them would do all that. So when they do that, they will be working for the instrumentality of the state in connection with the state's scheme. They will, get protected. They will also get protected. Law says that? Yes. Working for the instrument. I had a slide also on that. Mm -hmm. Who is the implementing agency for this act? They as for allocations of business rules, IT ministry? Yes, MEIT. MEIT and they are going to create a data protection board which will be a very powerful body which will determine the, how the act is implemented mm -hmm. and that will be the body which will decide on complaints, that will be the body which will hear the disputes, etc. And uh, <coughs> hopefully it has got good members. In terms of capacity building, what is the the road ahead, how is it being planned? Because it's mass, what's happening is massive. My biggest worry would be lack of awareness. The, this, this number itself is an indication. Normally, you should probably have, you know, hordes of people attending this kind of an event just to be aware of this. And uh, even in the uh, general space in industry, 
because I deal with all kinds of clients. The awareness level is very, very poor because they think that it has not come, it won't come or it is yet to come to me. So they and they think that overnight they can change. So as you said, the capacity building will start from understanding your own business. That is the biggest challenge would be uh, in-house assessment of where is the possibility of leakage or where is the possibility of collection of data because you don't even know who's collecting what data. Today, the biggest challenge is everybody collects information and the information is not analyzed, information is not subject to any kind of audit, data is not subject to any kind of audit. It just flows up and down in the organization. So your biggest challenge would be to understand your own model and then see where are the interface points where information is collected and then start reviewing whether this is really necessary for your functioning and can you stop even before the act comes that this you know we can stop collecting this data and then where you decide that these are core functions where data is in inevitable and I have to collect it then why the collection of data what is the usage of that particular data if you start that then comes the last part of say or securing that data and that is an IT function which your IT team will take care they will enhance security they will enhance cyber security and take care That's what I said, no, it's unfortunate that the awareness is so poor. In, you, you'll be surprised that uh, this legislation has been understood by very big players very quickly. Uh, some major Indian companies, businesses have understood this impact of this and they've already started reviewing, talking to us on contracts, etc. The biggest hit will be on MSME. MSME will be the biggest hit. Wow, because they are all struggling with cash flow issues, they have working capital issues, they are survival issues. So, you know, they, they, this is their last priority when it comes to all that. Vanda Pathakala said, no, their biggest today is tomorrow, should I pay this, should I pay the PF, should I pay the EB or should I pay the GST or should I pay the TDS? Which fellow is more aggressive than the rest? I will first pay that, then move forward. No, that is his, today's scenario. So, for him, if it hits, it will wipe him out. So, that is where, you know, probably government should also think about a longer cushion period for MSMEs instead of, you know, have a standard level. Maybe, so it's like, you know, exam postponing by one month. You'll wait for another uh, 29 days before you start preparation. Mr. Suresh. What are It will be the most powerful body than any other body in the country because of the act. The act is overarching. It can touch anybody and therefore data production board is going to be the most powerful board because the penalties they are talking about is much more than competition commission. Correct. The penalties are huge so and therefore it is going to have an impact and uh, there is only, there is one interesting Mr. Ra Rajiv Chandrasekhar who is the minister for MEIT. In the last two, three, week, three weeks back he was gave an interview saying that we may look at it very differently and appoint uh, even young experts into the data production board. So instead of having, you know, old bureaucrat thinking of, you know, I will use retired secretaries or, you know, somebody who's, you know, retired completely from everything, put them there and give them a role of a new tech law. And so they may probably do somebody who can understand technology much better. Or they could have a mix. My view is that you need that experience and the youth. It can't be totally youth, it can't be totally, you know, experience. It must be a mix of both, then it will work. Sir, it seems that this was an unregulated area so far, right? Yes. So, what was the driver for this regulation really? Because really, you know, even today, what you're talking about is obligations emerging because of the new act, whereby you'll have to kind of con conform to n necessary disclosures, necessary policy guidelines. You know, what has gone wrong so far? What are we trying to protect? What are we trying to, you know, uh, ensure that we... See, what I is happening today is, uh, thanks to Supreme Court and thanks to overall thinking in the world, we are redefining our own rights. So, as in some, the old traditional thinking was, uh, state is supreme, individuals are just, you know, power citizens, they have to listen to the state. But the new thinking is that you can't take citizen for granted. Citizen has got an equal role in the state and his rights are equally important. That is how the right of privacy itself came in. Right of privacy is never there in the constitution, but it was interpreted to be in the constitution by, by saying that right to life includes right to privacy. 
So once right to privacy came, then all these other questions came. Like, you know, like yesterday's Supreme Court judgment. The, the, the union, whether it is permissible or not. Of course, it's an interesting thing that, you know, a lot of people are lamenting against the Supreme Court, saying that why did Supreme Court not uh, endorse this uh, union? What is the problem with Supreme Court? Why are they outdated in their thinking, etc.? Supreme Court cannot do, cannot make law. The challenge before the Supreme Court was, they, the petitioners had said the entire Special Marriage Act should be declared as unconstitutional. You can't declare a Special Marriage Act as unconstitutional. Then you will never have a marriage with, with, with different religions. That is not, not, even cast, not even possible. So court said that, look, we can't write the law, nor we can dictate the law. It is only the parliament which can make the law. And parliament will not make the law when you have a whole set of communities saying that don't make such a law. So at least definitely not during elections. So you will have changes that can happen at any point of time depending upon the environment that happens. But the rights which we talk about when we talk about privacy, everybody was complaining saying that my information is available everywhere. My personal data is leaked everywhere. I am getting tormented by marketing calls from anywhere. So that is how the complaints slowly started. It started with banks. Banks, you know, the insurance companies and banks. Then complaints went to RBI. Then the do not disturb concept came in. That didn't work. Because you, you block one number, another number comes. You block that number, another number comes. So it keeps on coming. So, and then they w saw what happened in UK, GDPR. So when global data protection, the European law was quite successful in its implementation. They said that U U.S. also has got some kind of a data protection. India had never had data protection. as a Consumer Protection Act is there today, but there is one word there which says leakage of data can be a consumer offence. And you know how Consumer Protection Act works. By the time you get relief, uh, legal air only can claim that 5,000 rupees compensation. They, they can't give compensation like in U.S. also. So it's tough. So they realize that they need a special separate piece of legislation. That's how it came. Uh, can I just add to that? So it's actually... Since I have a background, Puttasami case was a case which we fought when I was the Registrar General of Census and we were preparing the NPR. So the basic problem started when there was this Aadhaar and there was the National Population Register. The Population Register was being done under an act, which was the Citizenship Act, whereas the Aadhaar did not have any legal backing. That was when people started agitating for a protection uh, when we are having I had the data of a billion people in my computer sitting on my table and if it had leaked I would have been in jail for the rest of my life but the point was that there was no law and that was when Justice Sri Krishna was appointed to look into privacy issues and there were a slew of petitions before the Supreme Court on the on the ground that look state is collecting all this data what is it going to use it for because they had quoted many things like nazi germany where nazi germany collected this data which came from the census identified those families which had to be exterminated and went about systematically you know eliminating them so those fears were there that was the state collecting all this data and will it be able to you know replicate something like the Holocaust uh, which happened. Germany has a law which says that no data can be collected and stored. Any personal data can be given back to you in the form of a card where you choose whether to disclose that data or something for availing a service. But the state will not maintain any database of its citizens, any private citizens data will not be stored or collected and collated. This is the German law. That is where it started. This whole debate started and uh, Justice Puttasamy's case was a very, it, they were, if you go to the uh, surf the net, there will be 3000 odd uh, things in the in net about data privacy, where uh, the state is, you know, collecting data, what is it going to do with the data, what is the protection for my data, etc. So it started then, Justice Sri Krishna gave his report, but to become a law it has taken another 10, 10 years, we are talking of 2011, it's already 23, still. That is what Sri Krishna didn't want. He, he wanted accountability also. Yes. But uh, it's given a go by. Yeah, so that, uh, mm. 
Yes, we have a last question there, please. Sir, <coughs> there is unlawful accumulation of money in various sectors, in education sector, business sector, industrial sector, sector, not only in the political sector. It is happening everywhere, in all sectors. So, how do we control it by using digital recording you have of listened, many things? You should have listened Is to it possible in the name of privacy? No, you should have listened to our... Do we stop uh, recording so many developments in each sector? So, the digitalization should do, be helpful to uh, <coughs> remove some problems in the society, corruption and so many things. Income, in, in evasion of income tax. In so many areas, there are problems. No, so no. nowadays, the digital, digital has this become... Act does not prevent the government from collecting the data and using it. It has to be used effectively. I, I will answer your question. It has to be used I effectively. I don't know whether we are using the digital. No, no, I'll give you an answer. It's a boon. Have you we gone, have to use it have uh, you properly. Gone to, have you gone to sub office for land registration, property registration? If you go to sub office, throughout the office there are web cameras. But that doesn't stop whatever nefarious activities that happen. In front of cameras, there are officers who feel that they can do whatever they want to do. Some have been pulled up recently and you know transferred and all that. But it's still a long journey. So corruption is a serious issue, which digitization can help to some extent to prevent, so long as somebody is willing to prevent it. Otherwise, it is only going to be collected to be misused at a later point of time. It will be used for some other purpose. So you can't stop all that. But your, for your answer of you know, unaccounted money and things like that, today data analytics at, is at its peak. Why do you think so many people are being raided or so many notices are being given across? Because there is information that is pouring in. Your lifestyle indicates they are doing all these things, but your income tax return does not match your lifestyle. You will get a notice. And those notices are flowing. So you, it, it's just a matter of time. But it is also citizen's apathy. You know? you, 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 it has to come from within. You have to accept the law and follow the rule of law. It starts with your stopping in signal in time, not go, you know, violating your lane discipline. It starts everywhere. You want to break the queue for some reason because you are in a, uh, in a rush. You give your reasons for it and do it. You, want, you don't want to wait for three and a half hours in an SRO's office for a property registration because you have to quickly go and meet somebody and therefore you, do, you take a shorter route. Why are you taking a shorter route? Wait, finish it. If everybody starts doing that, then you will find that the appetite for all this will also come down. So to add further, you have the databases now talking to each other. Income tax database talks to the GST database, GST database talks to the other financial. So you see that no transaction can actually go unnoticed today because each of these databases is talking to each other. And that is why you see the indirect taxes as well as the direct taxes collection is going up day by day. Because people know that it is not possible to evade. So like this, the digitalization will lead to more and more transparency as the days go by. So I must come to the end of this uh, session, which has been very interesting. And I can only heave a sigh, a sigh of relief that I've been there, done that, but the act was not there at that time. <laughs> you wouldn't believe, someone was telling me that Many of you use a robo maid. It's a machine which goes and sweeps and swabs your flow. But do you know that even that machine is emitting data back to Amazon? Alexa, which is being used, is transmitting your day to day, whatever is happening in your house. Today, if you are just thinking of something and you find an ad is coming in your uh, Google, uh, feed that uh, it is prompting you towards certain decisions. So data is going to is being given in this act. The companies which are collecting such data without your knowledge will be brought to book is the hope. And I think it's a very timely uh, warning that you have given us that we have to be prepared uh, to face the challenges that this act will bring about. Uh, I'm reminded of a very senior bureaucrat when we started this whole exercise of NPR and the citizen's card, he said, you're only putting in place another instrument of oppression. 
and i think every act would also have with it negative consequences but how do we protect ourselves against the excesses of the state and protect uh, we will have to really you know find that balance which uh, mr vaidyasan very aptly pointed out that has to be a balance we are in a digital world where data is being collected with or without your consent but it has to be regulated and we have to be aware so thank you very much for bringing about that awareness and uh, we hope you know this awareness spreads to more and more people and we uh, sort of take an informed decision wherever we are asked for some data and uh, so thank you very much sir now about the next event we have it on uh, the 27th this is on the champions of indian industry and this will be uh, it's a book and uh, one mr balaji is the author of the book it covers a lot of the champions of tamil nadu's industry also and it will be an interesting uh, event where we get to know and after that is an extremely topical event on the israel palestine conflict and we have a very eminent panel there we have a uh, uh, two ambassadors one coming down from delhi uh, you might have seen him on the uh, as the spokesperson mr navtej sarna is coming down along with uh, mr tirumurthy who was our permanent representative to the un so it's a very eminent panel and we hope that more and more of you come and attend that session too so thank you very much for attending today's session and see you again next week and the week after that thank you